Hey everyone, welcome to day five of our Python class. On today, the last day, we're going to talk about something really exciting. Organization, my favorite topic. Certainly not glamorous, but definitely important. So, let's talk about importing in Python. You've already done this quite a bit. You've imported quite a few things, but I'll give you a quick recap. If we go ahead and just type Python to open up our interpreter, and then type what I have here, requests.get. So you saw this last time, request.getgoogle.com. That's going to send a request out to google.com. And press enter. You're going to get a name error, which says requests is not defined. However, if we import requests and press enter, and then run that same command again, request.getgoogle.com, it's going to give us back a response, 200. So what we've done by importing requests is told Python, hey, there's a bit of code somewhere that we want to use. Python doesn't know you want to use it until you tell it you want to use it. So here we're saying, I want to use requests. Once you've imported it, we can make this call just like normal. Request.get will work just fine. So let's talk about what an import actually is. This is fun. You should open up your Venn folder at this point. So we've had our Venn since the very start of the class. It's our virtual environment where all of our Python stuff is stored. And I think we talked a little bit about this, but if you dive into this thing and you open up venvlib, you're going to see like a whole bunch of stuff. And if you dive into, you know, scripts has got some stuff, <clears throat> but mostly this, this lib site packages folder. Here, is our requests package right here. And if you open that up, there's a whole bunch of Python files in here. And really, what's happening when you import requests is you're actually importing this init file. In here is all the Python code that they've written to handle requests. In fact, if you open up, I think I talk about this in a second. If you open up uh, api.py and scroll down, there's the get function right there. So you are actually importing that when we run requests.get. But I'm getting ahead of myself there. This point is, this venv stores a whole bunch of other Python code that you could use, but you have to tell Python to use it. So one of the exercises that I'm going to run us through is actually renaming one of these folders so you can see exactly how this works. So I'm going to take this requests folder, and I'm actually going to rename it to something else, literally. So I've taken this folder inside vem, and I've renamed it to something else. <clears throat> if I type Python now, reopen my interpreter, and I try to import requests, it's going to tell me that it can't find requests anymore, which makes sense because requests doesn't exist. We've renamed it to something else. If I type something else, import something else, it works just fine. And now, even funnier, is I can call something else dot get https colon slash slash google.com. And something else is now treated exactly the same way requests was treated before, simply because we've renamed the folder. So there's nothing magical about importing. It's just alerting Python that there is a folder or file on your system that contains Python code that you want to run. At this point, go ahead and type exit and rename something else back to requests. So there we go, request back in our place. Now renaming like stuff like that is actually pretty useful because let's imagine you were working on a Python project and you wanted to call it requests, something entirely different. Let's say that you were building a, a very polite home automation app and you want to request your thermostat to turn down. You might call it requests. You might make different requests to your stuff around your house. Point is, you've named your Python uh, program requests and the requests library is incredibly popular, and so it's already out there. But if you want to keep your name, the name you've chosen, you might be tempted to rename requests to something else, and you can use requests just like normal. Well, fortunately, you don't have to dive into the folder structure to do this. It's going to work just as well if we use the as keyword. So I'm going to collapse my venv again so we're not looking at that, and I'm going to show you how this works. Type Python again to open up your interpreter once more, and then import requests as something else. This has the same effect as importing requests, 
but you've renamed it. Requests.get, https colon slash slash google.com, will not work because we haven't imported the requests name. We've imported something else. And now if I run something else.get, google.com, there we go. It works just as though we had renamed the folder. And that means that you can name something requests. And you could use something called requests that isn't the requests library. So we can rename our imports using as. Likewise, we can also do this. I can import requests at this point. I can run requests.get now that I've imported requests. And it'll work just the way that we had it before. Something else.get, http colon slash slash google.com, also works. So you have two different ways of calling the requests function now. Is this practical? No, not really. There's nothing, there's nothing useful really about importing something under a different name. In fact, that might make it more confusing. But it's important to know that as truly does name this something different. And I can import requests now and have something else, even though they're the same stuff. So we can name things differently and Python won't conflict with itself. At this point, go ahead and exit out of our interpreter again. So now we have to talk about dots, because you've seen dots all over the place, but you probably up until this point have either ignored them, assumed they were just part of the syntax, or haven't really broken down what they're for. So when you type requests dot get, do it in here. Here we go. Requests dot get open parenthesis. The dot means we can split that thing apart. Requests and get are actually two completely different things. Requests dot get run together like this isn't its own program. Instead, what we're actually calling is, hey, from this requests thing, run the get function. And when I opened up then requests api.py, I showed you the get function. It's not called requests.get, it's called get. And requests is the folder that it lives in. What does this mean for you? It means that we can syntactically break apart requests and get into two separate things. In fact, we can do that pretty easily by using from. Now, I think you'll have seen this before, but the basic syntax is from requests import or from something import. Instead of saying import requests, we're saying, hey, from requests, this folder or file called requests, import that thing called get, which does something useful for us. If I press enter, we're not going to see anything, but now I can do this. Get, whoops, there we go, if I can copy, get https colon slash slash google.com. I don't have to put a requests dot in front of it anymore. I've effectively imported just the get function. And to drive this point home, I'm going to go ahead and run the post function. So requests.post is just as valid as requests.get. And if I had imported requests, I'd have access to requests.get, requests.post, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, anything under the request package. But because I've just imported get, I can't do this. Post https colon slash slash google.com. Even though request.post is perfectly valid. Why can't I just run post by itself? Because I haven't imported post. I've only imported get. So at this point, I can run from requests, import post. And now I can type post https colon slash slash google.com. And we get a valid response back. So from lets us specify the pieces of the Python package that we want to use. This helps keep our code clean. It means we don't import as much stuff into our files, which is good. And it means that we can more finely control what exactly is getting used. Sometimes, if you're using the requests package especially, um, if you, unless you read through the entire you know, file of code, you're not going to know right off the bat what functions you're using from requests. You can imagine this could get complicated if you have a Python program that's 5,000 lines long and you import requests at the top. 
You're going to have to, if you want to remove the requests package or use something else, find every single instance of requests.get. But if you use from and you say from requests import and you're only using the get function, for example, well, if you want to replace the requests package and use something else, all you know is that you have to find an equivalent get function. It makes it easier to clean things up later. It also tells people what you're actually using. Sometimes, for example, um, you might not want to use all the different modules. So if I only need the get function in my program, maybe I don't need the entire requests library. Maybe there's a way to build the requests library without certain functionality. And maybe that makes it smaller in size, so it's quicker to download and quicker to be you know, more portable, stuff like that. Well, in that case, having that from specifying specifically what you're importing is super important because it makes your code easier to read through and it tells people specifically what's required. All right, so rant about from aside, the gist of it is you can specify which items you want to import from something. And the way you know that you can use from is if you see a dot. So if you are calling something dot something, you know that you can break it apart using from if you import it. All right, so at this point, type exit and press enter. We're going to move on to our next part, which is going to be breaking apart our terrible weather app. So what's the best way to demonstrate the power of imports? Why it's going to be to revive our weather app from day two and break it apart, completely destroy it. So just to remind everybody, if I type Python weather app.py and press enter, we have our terrible weather app. It's going to make me guess what the weather is. It's not actually going to tell me. I'm just going to go, yes, 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 yes. That's fine. So everything is working. Let's open up weather or weather app.py and remind ourselves what was going on here. We imported random. We created these four variables to hold the weather condition, the current weather condition. We had our print statements. So if warm, blah, 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 if raining or warm, if raining or snowing, all this stuff. And then we had these, these four guessing chunks, which just asked a user to import their guess and told them whether they were correct or not. So we've got three distinct sections. Section one, our variable assignment. Section two, printing out our information. Section three, asking the user to guess. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense so far. Let's destroy it. We're going to start by opening a new, or sorry, we're going to start by creating a new file called weatherconfig.py in the root directory. So I'm going to click in my blank space down here, click new file, make a file called weatherconfig.py. And weatherconfig.py is going to hold these four variables. So we can think of these as our configuration variables. This is kind of what they're doing. They're configuring the way the rest of the app works, right? The rest of this program relies on warm, cold, raining, snowing. It can't work without those variables. So I'm going to take these four variables. Here we go. And I'm going to paste them in here. And then I'm going to save. Then I'm going to come back over to weather app, and I'm going to delete them. There we go. So I've gotten rid of the variables from my weather app.py. The other thing I'm going to do is remove import random. If I highlight random really quick or I do a search on random, you'll notice we're not using it anymore. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of it here because we're not using random in weather app.py anymore. Save that. We are using random now in this new file. And now that you know how imports work, you'll know that we have to say import random. As an aside, by the way, remember what the dot means here. I don't mention this in the docs, but we say warm equals random dot choice. What does that mean? That means that we could say from random import choice. In fact, for the video, I'm going to do that from random import choice. And now I don't have to say random dot choice. I can just say warm equals choice, true, false. Raining equals choice, true, false. Look how much nicer that looks. That's a lot nicer. So we've imported random, right? We've, we've taken our configuration variables, we put them in a new file. At this point, if you try to run weather app, nothing's going to work because it has no idea what you did with its variables. So we got to give them back to it. So we're going to add this line to the top of our file. 
from weather config import warm save now hold on a second are you telling me that if i put from weather config that python knows to open this file that i just made read in the variables from this file and then add it to this file why yes that is exactly what i'm telling you if you from a file name without the .py at the end. That's important. You might be tempted to try this from weatherconfig.py. If you just give the name of the file from weatherconfig import warm, Python will know to check to see if there is a file here that matches that name. So from weatherconfig import warm literally loads the warm variable from weather app. How else could I do this? I could say import weather config and then say weather config dot warm to reference the warm variable. Because remember, this dot is weather config dot warm. So we can import a variable from our file and we can do it this way or we can do it my preferred way from weather config import warm. Now, what was our error? Our, name, our, na our error down here was name error. Name warm is not defined. So now that we're importing warm, warm is, no warm is not defined down here, should go away. Now warm should be defined. Let's find out if we're right about that. So let's run python weatherapp.py. Ah, okay. That's a lot better. Now we're saying raining is not defined. So we've defined warm, but we haven't defined raining, and it's going to complain about cold and snowing and all of the other variables that we're going to have to use in our program. Okay, well, it's going to get really annoying to write from weather config import raining test from weather config. Uh, it didn't even work. For, oh, yeah, I didn't save from weather config import, okay, like that's awful, right? We don't wanna do that. We don't wanna type these out every single time. The other thing we probably don't wanna do is like from weather config import warm, comma, raining, comma, cold, like, you know, we could do that. We can use commas to denote lots of things we wanna import, but realistically, we, we want to, we know we wanna use every single variable in here. So we're gonna tell Python, we wanna use every single thing in here. And the way we're going to do that is by using a star. So instead of saying from weather config import warm, we're going to say from weather config import star. Star means everything, literally everything in this file. Warm, cold, raining, snowing. Import everything and make it available as though it were up here. So this star, you can think of it like this it literally inserts this code at the top. So from weather config import star takes this code and just chucks it in right there. So it is as though it's there. It's, a, it's the ghost of our variables. But of course we don't see it here. And that means things keep clean because now we can store these variables somewhere else and we don't have to put them in our file anymore, which is really nice. Okay. So now that we've imported star, let's see if things are working. Python weatherapp.py, press enter, everything works. And again, I'm just going to go yes, 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 yes. Look at that. Our variables aren't in here anymore. They're over here. We've removed them from our app. But nevertheless, we can run Python weatherapp.py, and it'll work as though the variables are there. And that is super, super useful. But now we're going to break it even further. We've done a little bit of breaking. We've removed the variables. But now we're going to make it reusable and modular. Things people tend to like when they're doing programming. So starting at what is now line three, right above the SIF statement, we're going to add this, def print clues. Now remember I said that these are kind of broken into, into three chunks, now just two chunks, because the first chunk is literally gone. It's over here. So 
This chunk, right, now we're down to two chunks. This chunk was the clues chunk. Like, it's the thing that prints out the clues for our weather app. This chunk is the guessing chunk. Well, in programming, what do we do with chunks? We turn them into functions because each chunk has a purpose. And we can write that purpose in the function name. So I'm going to write def print clues. So I'm saying this chunk is the print clues chunk. How do I tell Python, though, that this is all included in the print clues and this isn't? The answer is I indent this stuff. So I'm going to highlight everything up to print. So I'm just going to highlight it like this. And I'm going to press tab. And I'm going to indent everything once. So all this stuff now lives under print clues. OK. Now that we have our print clues chunk, we should make our guesses chunk, our, our check guesses chunk. And that's what's going to go down here. So I'm going to say def check guesses colon underneath check guesses now we have to do exactly the same thing so we're going to highlight everything starting at line 17 all the way down through 47 and tab in once so now all of these things are underneath our check guesses function so now we've truly broken it into two, two distinct sections. There's a, there's a print clues section and there's a check guesses section. Now, I'll let you guess before you do this what's going to happen if I run pythonweatherapp.py at this point. You can decide whether it will work or not work. Are your guesses in? Let's find out. It doesn't work. Nothing happens. Why does nothing happen? Well, because these aren't running anymore. Originally, when we ran Python Weather App, this code executed. But now it's stored under a function. And this code isn't going to run. How do we get it to run? We're actually going to make a new file that runs our code for us. And we're going to call it weatherrun.py. So click in the blank space down here, make a new file, name it weatherrun.py. Inside weatherrun.py, add this code that I have here and save. Check this out. From weather app, and we know that weather app is the name of a file. It's right there. So from our weather app, import, print clues, and check guesses. If we go over to our other app, we've got a print clues function and a check guesses function. So we've told Python, hey, I'm going to be using the function print clues and the function check guesses in our program. So now you know you can import variable names and functions. And we've done both. Then on lines three and four, look how much simpler our weather app is now. It's like three lines long. That's fantastic. We print our clues and we check our guesses. That's it. We're going to run the function by putting this after them. Print clues, check guesses. Who's ready to try this out? Python weather, oops, run.py. Press enter. Ah, look at that. Our weather app is back. Look how small it is. This is awesome. This is super readable. I can see exactly what's happening. I'm printing the clues and I'm checking the guesses. And that's all that's happening. I'm printing the clues and then I'm checking the guesses. Our weather app has two primary functions. And we've made it super simple to read. So now that you have a better idea of how your weather app can be simplified, let's take it one step further and actually import it in the terminal. We've imported it here. But we can do exactly the same thing here. So type Python and press enter to start your interpreter. And then type import weather run. And check this out. Our program's going to run. Because when we import something, it runs the Python code that's in that file. So when we import weather run, it runs our Python code. And I can run through and do this. There we go. That's important. Import runs the Python code that we're using. And so does from. 
from something import something runs that Python code. We don't want your app to run when you import it. Let's make that very clear. This is a problem. Let me explain why this is a problem. If I import a program at the top of my file, you can imagine like here, for example, from weather config import star, okay? And I have Python code defined after that. I don't want any of this to execute. I don't expect any of this to execute. If I'm importing something, I don't expect any code to run that requires, for example, user input. That could be disastrous for an automated app that I'm trying to write where there isn't gonna be a user to input. So we need to fix this to make sure that when someone imports our weather run or our weather app, stuff doesn't run. And the way we're gonna do that is with something you've also seen before. This if name equal equal main section. All I'm gonna do is add if name underscore underscore name, which is a variable in Python, equal equal quote underscore underscore main colon above print clues and check guesses. So I'm just adding this. So if name equal equal main, do this. The variable name will only be underscore underscore main underscore underscore if the Python program is being run like this. Python weather run dot pi. When I import something, name, this variable, is not main. So this if statement checks to see if we are running our Python program straight from the interpreter Python weather run dot pi or if we're importing it. This is how you build a program that is importable and friendly, but also has terminal command line interfaces. Go ahead and save at this point and run Python weather run dot pi. Again, you can see everything is working. Yeah, 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 sure. I'll look at that. All right. So our Python program is running, but check this out. Now, when I run my Python interpreter and I run import weather run, nothing happens. We've successfully separated the part that we want users to interact with in the terminal from the part we might want users to import. And that is really nice for people who want to use pieces of your, of your program in something other than their terminal interface. We're about to dive into something where you might actually want to use pieces of your program somewhere else by breaking apart the menu that you wrote last class. So I'm gonna go ahead and type exit from our Python interpreter and we're gonna talk about importing our menu. So the first thing we're gonna do is open menu.py. There we go. There's our menu that we wrote last time with our, four, our, our three functions to do things and our, our section down here. We're just gonna have this open as reference. Down in our terminal, we're gonna type Python to open our interpreter, and then we're gonna type import, whoops, import menu. Now, based on our weather app, if we import menu and we know that it runs all the code, what's going to happen? Nothing. Because cleverly, in the last class, we already included an if name equal equal main block, which runs our main section of code. But our functions up here don't do anything unless we run them ourselves. And so now, in our Python interpreter, we can do things like, for example, menu.update people. Except we can't because it's missing one required positional argument, people. In fact, it's gonna be really hard for us to run anything. Uh, we could do menu.list people, there we go. And it's gonna complain about the same thing. Even menu.clear people. This is really hard to use, uh, mostly because if we want this to work, for example, we'd have to say menu.update people none. And only then will it run. Because update people, our function up here, expects one variable, people. If we're not providing it that variable, it is going to complain. 
And so the first thing we're going to do is define what's called a default value for our variables. Because we want to be able to run menu.update people. This function should probably, the first time it runs, update our people and return a future, an update. So we're going to redefine our functions. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set this function, def list people, to list people future equals none, people equal none. So at this point, our default values for list people are none and none. We don't have to pass none in anymore. And to really drive this point home, you have to exit again. So you're, every time you want to re-import something, by the way, this is important. You have to exit out of your interpreter and then restart it. That's why I've been having us do that so much. Because now I can import menu and run menu.listPeople. And it runs without us having to do anything. Oh, we get some odd output. But we know what this output is because list people first prints people, which is none since we passed none in as the people, and returns a tuple with our future and our people. And that's what's happening here. This is our tuple. But since our future was none by default and our people was none by default, it just returns none comma none. So we know what's happening down here. So when we pass it or when we just do menu.list people with, with nothing passed into it, we get back none. We've solved one problem. However, menu.clear people, for example, still doesn't work. So we need to fix each of the other functions. So we're going to do the same thing. Update people equals none. Clear people equals none. Now, I know I said it, but I'm just going to make a point of it here. I've updated menu.py. I've saved menu.py. And I'm going to run menu. So it's just going to run update people. Oh no, what's going on? I thought I fixed my function. Remember, even if I do this, I ran import menu again. It's still going to complain. I have to fully exit and reopen the interpreter in order to run our new function with import menu. Python caches the contents of a Python file. They're actually cached in this PyCache file up here. So we get this menu.cpython39.pyc. If you're using the cpython interpreter, at least that's how it works. PyCache doesn't overwrite until you've imported it again from a new session, basically. So all that means for you is if you modify something and you want to test it out, you've got to exit out of the interpreter and re-import it. And that's what we're doing. So now that we've set our default values for each of these functions, I can say menu.updatePeople, there we go, without passing anything, and check that out. Our menu.updatePeople function works. Now we do get servers now running, so we're going to talk about that in a second, but I'm going to scroll down. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the, the update people function itself. Actually, do I tell you to run the server here? Let's see. Oh, yeah, I skipped a step. Sorry, we should be running our servers at this point. That's an easy fix, though. I'm going to click the plus over here and run python manage.py run server. Cool. Our server's running. If I come back up to this terminal here by using this dropdown and run menu.updatePeople, we shouldn't get this server is not running. Ah, there we go. Now we should see our people. Successfully updated people, and it prints them out. OK. So at this point, there's a bit of an interesting dilemma. And this is where you have to make an architectural decision. Update people, from my perspective, is meant to run in the background. That's why, down in our menu, when we built the function that runs when we run it, we use this thread pool executor dot submit update people people. I want, I intend for, update people to be run in the background so I can keep doing things. Now, you have to make a decision. Do we alert people to the fact that update people makes a request and could potentially take a long time? Or do we build in our background process to the update people function 
so that our end user has no choice but to run it in the background, just like we intend. This is a decision you will have to make. Right now, I've made it for you. I've decided that, yep, update people is always a background function. I want it to run in the background, no matter whether you're running from an import or whether you're running it from a the, the menu that I've built. I always want it to run in the background. I want the end user to have no control over that because I've written a function that behaves a specific way, and I want there to be a specific user experience associated with this function. And that's what we're going to do. I'm going to make it so that when you run menu.updatePeople after importing menu, it runs in the background. And it'll work exactly the same way as if I run Python menu.py. Well, how am I going to do that? That seems a little tricky, especially because we've used this thread pool executor.submit update people, people. Like this is this is fairly complicated. And the only way this works is because. I was able to pass in a people object and I was able to pass in the function. I had complete control over how the update people function runs when I run it in my custom menu. So how am I going to turn this update people function into something that runs in the background? And the answer is we're going to use something known as a decorator. Now, much like background processes and threading itself. This is another one of those advanced topics, quote unquote, that you definitely won't be taught in an intro to Python class, but we're going to cover because I think it's a lot of fun and it's very useful. So we're going to add this chunk of code above list people. Oops, and mine didn't copy for some reason. There we go. And there we go. Def run in background function. Okay. This can look complicated. It's really simple to break down what's happening here. I've created a function called run in background, just like we've created a function update people and list fun and list people. Run in background takes one argument, just like list or just like update people takes in one argument people. That argument is a function. That function could be list people or update people or clear people. It's a function. Inside this function, there's another function called wrapper. Wrapper takes in special arguments. These are special arguments. Star args, star star k args. These stand for arguments and keyword, kw, keyword arguments. This future equals none is called a keyword argument. Future is the keyword. None is the argument. An arg is like this, just function. It doesn't have a value by default. It is just an argument, and we could pass anything we wanted in here. Args and kwargs, with a star and star star in front of them, tell Python to take a tuple, args, because remember, this is a tuple, right? Here we go. This, the, we know what a tuple is future comma people. Take this tuple and break it apart. Take this and instead of being this, the parenthesis, future comma people, just make it future comma people with no parentheses. Now there's no way of displaying this in Python. I can't print this out for you. You just have to take my word for it that it is just chopping off the parentheses and passing the things that we pass into args into our wrapper function. The next thing that's happening, this line should look familiar. It's the same here, thread pool executor dot submit. We run thread pool executor dot submit function, which is the function we passed in up here, which could be list people or update people. It will be update people. So function, right? Function. With its args down here, we passed in people. People, since it doesn't have an equals, is an arg, not a kwarg, so comma args, and any keyword arguments that we might have. I'm returning this thread pool executor, just like here I was assigning this equal to future, and then I'm returning this wrapper. This is syntax you kind of just have to memorize. Just know that it's a function inside a function, which takes in a function takes in arguments for that function, 
does something with that function, returns the wrapper. You're just going to have to take my word for it that this is how a decorator gets written. What this does, though, is it allows us to pass in a function that we can run in the background. Now, how the hell do we pass in a function? Well, okay. This is where we use the decorator symbol, which is at. And I've opened up a new window. Get out of there. So the next thing we do is add this little guy above update people. At run in background def update people. Okay. Run in background is our function name. If we put it in front of an at symbol directly above a function we're defining, then before this function runs, this function runs. So I'll explain exactly what's going to happen. We're going to import menu.py and we're going to run menu.update people. And here is exactly how Python will work. Hey, Python, run update people. All right, I got you. First thing I'm going to check, is there anything above update people? There is. Run in background. I need to run that first. Run in background takes, ah, I see it takes one argument. Well, the thing that comes after run in background is update people. So the argument function must be update people. So I'm going to run run in background with the argument peep, or update people. What's the first thing that happens in run in background? Oh, we define a new function. And it takes in star args and star star kwargs. Huh, where do I get star args and star star kwargs? Well, update people has args and kwargs, so it must be these. So I'm going to use these arguments in here. Cool. What's the next thing I have to do? I'm returning threadpool executor dot submit function args k works. Awesome. Got it. So I'm going to return that. And then what's the next thing I do? Ah, I'm returning this function I've just defined. Excellent. Okay. What's next? Ah, we're going to run through the function. Cool. Try response equals requests dot get. We run through the regular function. There we go. Okay. And what do I do with that function? This. So it's going to run through this function, but it's going to do this to it. So hopefully that made some sense. Python runs top to bottom, and it recognizes that if you have one of these decorators in front of your function, it needs to run this function, but only in the context of run in background. So it's going to run this first. Let's go ahead and give it a try. So let's exit Python, import menu, menu.update people. Oh, I didn't save. <laughs> there you go. Always save your files. I'm going to stop that from running. There we go. Exit Python, import menu, menu.update people. Ah, look at that. So it's no longer freezing our program. It returns us immediately to the Python prompt that we can use. And there, there we go. Successfully updated people. Cool. So our, our menu.update people function that we've imported into a totally separate program now runs in the background just as we wanted it to. But I think we've got a bit of a problem uh, because we've changed a fundamental property of how this function runs. But in our menu, we put the thread pool executor down here. So we've duplicated it. So what's going to happen if we run our regular menu now? Let's find out. Python menu.py. OK, uh, list. That works just fine. Clear. List. That works just fine. Uh, let's try update. Okay, that looks good to me. I'm going to wait for it to say successfully updated people. Let's go give it a second. It can take a minute. There we go. All right, and list. Uh, what is this? Oh, it's printed out our future object. What is going on? Uh, list again. Oh, what happened here? 
Well, what happened here was we just ran a thread pool executor in the background and we didn't get our people. We got the thread pool executor that was supposed to be running our function. The way to fix this is super easy. Now that our update people function runs in the background by itself without any interaction from us, we can delete this. Whoops, not that much. Delete this part. There we go. Add back our parentheses, and now we can run our update people function the same way we run our list people and clear people function. Look how much cleaner that is. Our update people List people and clear people now behave all exactly the same way. We've taken that background functionality, we've removed it from our menu, and we've applied it to our update people function in such a way that now, no matter what, no matter what you do, update people will always run in the background. We've guaranteed the way that function works. And I'm going to save that. So, exit python menu.py again, and let's just make sure everything is working. So list, whoops, not lizard, list, none, update, list, nothing yet, wait for it to update, there we go, and now list returns our people. So our update function still runs in the background, just like it did before, but we've now created this separate run in background function, which applies to update people such that in our menu and by exit, in our imports, they both run in the background. Okay, cool. So now let's actually put this to use. So we've imported our menu, but what I wanna show you is how you're actually gonna use this because this is not very helpful and then it says successfully updated people, but if I run menu.list people right now, it's going to say none. What is going on here? Well, the answer is our main function in our menu.py did a lot for us that up until this point we've taken for granted. Let me show you how you're going to recreate what happens up here using our import. So the first thing you're going to do is run update equals menu.update people. We're going to do, assign the output of menu.update people to this variable called update and press enter. Now at this point, update is the thing that was just printing out up here a second ago, but we have access to it. And that's important because list people takes a future. This is a future. Update is a future. And now what we're gonna do is run people equals menu.list people update. So we're going to pass in our update value to menu.list people. Hold on a second, you might be saying. List people takes two variables, future and people. How are you able to get away with just passing one? The answer is we've set a default value. People is none by default, which means we can just pass one variable and Python knows it's going to be the first one. And the first one is future. Update is our future. It gets passed in as the first variable. Future is now equal to update. People is now equal to none, since we haven't specified it. So people equals menu.list people, update, enter. And there's our all, all our people. We listed all of our people out. The cool thing is, because our list people function returns future and people, I can run people, and we get back two things, if I can scroll up and find it. The first thing we get is none. Our future is now none, since we've set future to none. And our people is our list of people, and so we can access that. So if I say people at one, which is the second item, there's our list of people. And if I say people at one at zero, so the first person, there's our first person. So that's pretty handy. You can now use your menu function from the Python interpreter, not just from the menu we've written. Now that in itself is helpful, but where is the actual use of being able to use something like this from the interpreter and from your menu? 
The answer is when you can import it. So let's actually use our imported menu. Your last file is going to be called print underscore people dot pi. Again, just clicking in the white space and then clicking the new file button. Inside print people dot pi, we're going to add this block of code. From menu, there's our menu, import, update people, there's our update people function, and list people, there's our list people function. And we're also doing this. We're saying from concurrent.futures import wait. This is one last part of import we haven't covered. You can actually use dots in front of from to import something that's multiple levels down. Sometimes there are things that are multiple levels down. Like this, for example, wait is inside concurrent.futures. What we can do is say from concurrent.futures import wait. The other way you would do this is say import concurrent, and then you would say concurrent.futures.wait. So remember, whenever we see a dot, we can split it apart with an import. What you can't do is this from concurrent import futures import. Like, don't think that the import is a replacement for the dot. You also shouldn't do this. But in some cases, Python will let you do this. So let me show you what I mean. If I run this, I'm going to get a syntax error. But if I run this, I'm just going to type it down here. Import concurrent.futures.wait. Whoops. I spelled that wrong. There we go. Import concurrent.futures. I can import concurrent.futures, but I can't from concurrent.futures import something. Or I can after I import it, I guess. Point is, don't don't do this. Don't don't do the don't do the period after the import. Um, or sorry, from concurrent import. Sorry, I can't do this. Futures.wait. No, you cannot do this. So don't do that. Always keep your periods before your imports. And please try not to do this. Like, or this, I guess. Because, yeah, this, whoops, come on, there we go. Um, this does specify I want to use the futures package. And it namespaces it. So maybe there is a situation where, like, you know, you're being very specific. Like, yes, I want to use concurrent.futures and type it out every time. But, like, if this, if futures conflicts with something, you really should be using as. Like, you should be saying uh, import, let's do this, from concurrent import futures as something else. If you ever get to the situation where you're like, do I want to import something dot something? No, import with as. Be specific. Use your Python syntax. So, from concurrent dot futures import wait. What does the wait function actually do? Well, remember that our update function now runs in the background no matter what. We haven't given the users a choice. It will always run in the background. In this case, I'm building a program that I need to wait for the update to finish before we list our people. I don't know how long that's going to take. Fortunately, Python provides a way for us to wait for something to finish. And it's using this wait function. So wait just says, hey, this update is running in the background. Wait for update to finish, then run the thing after it. So in our print people.py, we're going to make use of our two imported functions. We're going to say update equals update people. Wait for update to finish. And then list people update. Let's go ahead and give that a try. Python print people.py. And we're waiting. We're waiting for our program to finish. 
And there we go. You have successfully updated people, and then you've listed them. This is the power of imports and splitting your Python programs apart. Because at this point, you've imported a program that you wrote to communicate with an API to do something automatically. You wrote an API over here, or with, the Django, with Django, and then you wrote an interface for that API. You've architected a function that runs in the background. You've allowed a user to import that function into their own program. So they don't have to use your menu if they don't want to. They can use these functions that you wrote to work with your API in their own program, print people. And you've now given them a way to wait for those functions if they don't want to run them in the background. But update people will run in the background for them just as well as it runs in the background for you. So you haven't lost that expected behavior that you had initially defined for your function. So tying all that back together, importing lets you split your Python programs apart. It makes them way more readable. It allows other users to reuse pieces of code that you've written. And in a lot of cases, it allows you to specify what exactly you're using rather than just using everything. And with that, we're done with day five.